and I'd like. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right, we're we're on. Um, I also wanted to just say real quick, thank you very much for for asking uh, for asking me to be on your podcast. That's that's fun. Of course, yeah, yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I like uh, talking shop. I love it. <laughs> yes, likewise. And so, well, uh, for everyone that's going that's going to watch and listen to this episode, uh, here we have Anthony Whitechillis. Uh, Anthony, ep you're episode 62 of a conversation about art, and uh, welcome to my podcast. Why don't you tell? Why don't you talk a bit about who you are and what you do? Well, why don't you ask me specific questions? Oh, because I will in a bit. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, but we're just getting started. I, I'm an artist. I'm an educator. Uh -huh. um, and th that's about me in a nutshell. You know, I'm I'm specifically a Trump Lloyd painter. I am the co-founder of the uh, On the Art Academies, the International Education Project, founded by Tim Reynolds. My academy is here in Northeast Pennsylvania. I've been I've been teaching out of Pennsylvania now for oof, 20 odd years, creeping on 30. Mm -hmm. um, that's about it. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a very, I'm not a very complex person. That's about it. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Um, so the, these, that's, a, I guess that's another pronunciation thing that we were talking about that I get a kick out of. So trompe l'oeil paintings that you make yeah uh these are in oil is that right yes. correct okay. yes okay so tell me a bit about how your relationship with art or just making images started and you know how did you get to this point basically well at, at, at the risk of sounding incredibly uh, cliche to your listeners you know i i um i drew since i was really really young I mean, uh, I remember being incredibly small and going to my grandmother's house on Sundays. And I think um, my grandmother's house, she was always seeming, uh, she would always seem to be concerned that, you know, my brother and my sister and myself would maybe make a mess or be running around the house and accidentally break something or this mm -hmm. and that. So her go-to was, I, I remember she would just bring out these big stacks of paper mm -hmm. and just throw pencils and pens out. And we would just sit there and draw and draw and draw. And um, that, that just seemed my go-to thing to do when I, when I, when I wanted to relax or when I wanted to have fun. I mean, I was, a, we, we again, grew up in a, you know, somewhat suburban, somewhat rural area, uh, somewhere in between, so a lot of a lot of stuff was outdoors. There was there was a lot of outdoor activities, but I would say probably eighty percent of the time we were indoors. At least when I was indoors, I was drawing, mm -hmm. you know, always drawing, always, always, always drawing. And I um, would just I I never I never thought that I I could pursue it as a living. It it mm -hmm. just wasn't a possibility that was it wasn't a path that was illuminated at any time, especially through high school. And even when I, I went to college, I, you know, my, the, the, my, my first crack, it was just, you know, I'll take general studies. Cause you know, I really didn't know as, as much as I love to draw and as much of, uh, you know, as much of the, as much feedback as I had received, over the the years like oh you know you're 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 so good at this you're so good you should do this for a living you should do this professionally uh i i just didn't know that that was a thing you know mm -hmm. i didn't know how to do that i mean you read mm -hmm. stories about famous artists but i i didn't know how to chase any of that down or pursue any of that into a career or a livelihood i had no idea so i i entered college um you know just general studies just kind of wandering around and then i realized uh i i you know i i, I had seen um other students that were in the the art curriculum at this at this local college and i thought you know i I, I want to do that. You know, mm. I, I think I can do that, you know, and that's, that's how it, I, I got started um, in, in the academic realm. Prior to that, I was very fortunate that 
my mother, uh, my mother more so than uh, my father. My father always supported anything we did, but my mother really wanted us to have a really well-rounded education. We always had, um, you know, we always had to be studying an instrument. And then when I was 14, I did start taking formal art lessons. But again, I, I never thought about pursuing it beyond that in, mm. you know, into, uh, you know, my college years or anything. I, it just, I, I don't know why it just didn't seem like, oh, that's something I can go and do professionally. Mm. And um, I think I was about um, two years out of high school graduation. And that's when I really committed um, and again, I, I, like I said, I had taken a couple general, uh, general studies courses. And then I said, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna jump into this and see where it takes me. You know, it's, it's what I love to do. It, it, it seemed, it, it did not seem feasible that something I love to do so much that I would be able to make a living at, you know, it seemed like that. It just doesn't seem like it seemed too good to be true. Like mm -hmm. I could do this and make a living. That's, I don't know. It's just seen, I don't know, pick, you, you know, your, your, your most favorite activity that you would like to be, you know, pursuing almost no matter what. And, uh, that was art for me. And to, to find out, to learn that, Hey, I can do this for a living and, you know, make other people happy with what I'm doing. Yeah. It, 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 it's, while it seemed too good to be true, I, I jumped on that bandwagon. I, I, I jumped on that path and just kept going till, till now. Okay. Um, okay. And how, all right, give me a second. Take your time. So how do you think you went from the thought, not even crossing your mind that it was that an artistic career even existed to basically a 180 and being like, I'm going to make it my career, basically. Uh, what do you, I mean, was it just because you saw that it was available as a, uh, well, like, I, yeah, a, I like, think that was it. I think that was, you know, going, um, going to college and realizing, Hey, there, there are people majoring in this, you know, this, this, this is, this is like, this is a real thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really, I really wasn't sure. I was very fortunate in that when I was, um, uh, 13, 14, I started uh, taking formal art lessons uh, with a wonderful teacher, uh, which was here in Northeastern Pennsylvania. She had a little uh, art studio, I remember, in this area of Northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, Wilkes-Barre. And uh, her her studio was called the Art Hatchery. And, mm -hmm. you know, I remember going there and her name was uh, Judith Keats Hatcher. Uh, she's She was a... Um, just a, a wonderfully supportive and encouraging teacher. And she really encouraged like, Oh, you know, you should pursue this. You, you, you have a, you have a definite aptitude for this. Um, and then I think, well, one piece of the puzzle that might make sense. Uh, when I had gone to uh, this college, I found out that the teacher, this Judith, uh, Judith Keats, Hatcher that taught at the art hatchery mm. when I was 13, 14. She was a teacher at the college as well now. Mm. And that was that was really nice. And I'll tell you what, that was kind of one of the last pieces. Like, yeah, you know what? I shouldn't be doing this. I think just the fact that she was there, I kind of took as, you know, um, this this is this is gonna work. It it took one little piece of apprehension out, which just about tipped the scale that made me wanna think that I I could devote everything to this. And if if she's here and she's telling me that there's a viable path to a successful career, this is something I could really do. She believed that I have the aptitude to do this. I I'm an all chips in guy, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's it, it in, in a lot of aspects in my life, I'm all or nothing, you know, mm -hmm. and this was really it. All, all, all the chips were in and this is what I was going to do. And once mm -hmm. I was on that path, then, you know, I, not, nothing outside of, you know, a, a major catastrophe was going to alter that course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
so what so during the time so in the time during which you it didn't even occur to you that art could be a career was there anything I guess I'm just curious about what the environment was because it's like it seems like you uh, you said your mom was encouraging in in the sense uh of like you developing like a, an artistic sort of endeavor whether it was music yeah. or just like you have all of these pencils and papers and that kind yeah. of stuff but then otherwise like I wonder what I mean, if you remember what your impression of art or of artists was that it, it seems like what I'm understanding from what you're saying is that you just had like a neutral kind of view of it where it's just like, I love doing this, uh, but it looks like, I mean, I, 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 it, I don't think like, no, it didn't I, occur I, to you. I, I mean, yeah. and, and the reason for which I ask is because in my, in my case, for example, it's like, it was difficult for me, for example, uh, to decide that I wanted to study art because of the, of the of the stigma that is attached to it of like, oh, you're going to be starving. And it's like all of these stereotypes. And it's like, those are, it's like, I, I trepidated because of that. And it's like, no, those stereotypes are, aren't gone. It's like, it's still yeah. difficult. It's like, there's still, it's still difficult to be an artist. It's like, it's not easy. It's like, you don't forge your path the same way that a doctor does. You don't forge your path yeah. the same way a teacher does. So uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think that one of the things that, well, and to be, to be, clear like my my parents would have supported anything that I mm. wanted to do you know uh my father uh wasn't as um familiar with the arts I mean he 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 was uh you know he was uh in the military uh and um worked for the government for many years but he was also a trained musician he was a percussionist and uh definitely that was a big part of his life Mm -hmm. and but he really wasn't that familiar with a lot of visual art uh, my mother was more interested in the visual arts and she would you know she was really the one pushing for again this really well-rounded education mm -hmm. making sure that we're exposed to all these different things to kind of broaden our horizons and our outlook and, you know, grow some of our aspirations. But the, the, the unfortunate reality uh, of that time as compared to, as, as, you know, when, when contrasted against the atmosphere of education right now, the environment, the landscape, however you want to look at it is, skill-based art skill-based art access to programs that will teach you um, representational or figurative drawing skills or painting skills that was far 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 more scarce 30 some years ago mm -hmm. you know the the larger halls of academia seem to be more focused on the promotion of art as uh how could I say it? a a more esoteric conceptual pursuit mm -hmm. as a as opposed to some type of skill based production of a thing. And I think that was the the big difference, especially I noticed because I considered maybe, um, you know, because I, I again, I also had a lot of music education. I thought, well, maybe I'll do something uh, in music, even though like, you know, my always in the in the back of my mind, like art, visual art was first and foremost, the, the, the one of the great loves of my life. But again, when I was exposed to different art educational opportunities that may have been available when I was young, younger, um, it didn't really seem that that type of pursuit could yield something real. But when I did find that I was so very fortunate at the college uh, I went to, which was just a community college here in Northeastern Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. that they had a an amazing faculty of extremely skilled artists that were 
very well versed in skilled figurative or skilled mm -hmm. representational drawing and painting. Mm -hmm. And that's when I saw other students doing that and thought, oh, hey, I, I can do like I connected with that more than what I may have seen, uh, you know, in more of the larger halls of academia where there, there just didn't seem to be any emphasis on those skills. Mm -hmm. And um, even but but even in, in the college I went to and in, in a lot of the, the programs I looked to, um, there was a lot of variation, some variation that would be very frustrating to some people. And, you know, that's something I would address later on when I started teaching, you know, when I started developing my own curriculum that I wanted to teach. But uh, still, overall, regardless of some of the, you know, diverse, the, the, the the frustrating type of diversity that was built into some of the uh, these curricula, I, I was still elated to see like, oh, there's there's skill based mm. drawing and painting, there's skill based representation, skill based expression going on, okay. and that's the, again that's when I that's when I connected like, yeah, I I, I can do this, I want to do this, I understand what this teacher was telling me, uh, because that's what I did when I studied with um, Judy Hatcher, she. Mm saw that I had an aptitude for representation, but she was a very open teacher. She had a very uh, diverse skill set and she would do things, you know, she could teach uh, representation and she could teach, um, like she could teach objective visual communication or, or non-objective visual communication. And I, I think she could do both uh, incredibly well. And um you know, she definitely is the one that that gave me a lot of positive feedback about a, a, a very strong aptitude, um, a, a, um, you know, a capacity to pursue representational work. And so that's what I did, you know. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So if I'd like it, if you talked uh, a little bit uh, briefly about why do you paint Trump Loy? Hmm. Um. I want to make sure I, I I I give this some thought. I you know there there's a lot of um, answers that you can give for why you do a certain thing, mm -hmm. and when you start talking about why you do a certain thing, there's so many levels of resolution that you sure. can look to to answer that question. I I could look in some grand schematic of a deterministic universe and say i do it because i have no choice but mm -hmm. to do it mm -hmm. but that's not helpful to anyone <laughs> so i was very interested like i said once i was once i i discovered i was exposed to the fact that yes there are people that are doing very um very impressive very very impressive efforts uh representational efforts you know objective representational efforts at this at this school um that was like in, in that i was attracted to that i realized that i had this really big um passion for visual communication that was let's just say uh colloquially very realistic mm -hmm. and i say colloquially because that, that that's a whole thing mm -hmm. um because realistic sometimes doesn't necessarily communicate what i want it to communicate so but that that's the best that's the 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 most simple colloquial term i could think of right now just the more realistic these representations became the more excited and motivated I got, you know, the more I realized I could do, the more motivated I became mm. to work harder, to do it even better. And I remember I had gone to the, you know, Smithsonian uh, museums and, you know, a, a number of other museums, but I had never gone to the Metropolitan uh, Museum before I was in this, this college. And um, one of my 
teachers, uh, who was a guy by the name of uh, Michael Molnar, who was also a Trump Loy painter. And uh, he was teaching at this school. And he uh, was one of the teachers that kind of organized this big trip to the Metropolitan while I was studying at the, at the college. And I thought, well, I want to go there. And then I will never forget uh, walking into the American wing which was on the mezzanine uh, there was a, there was this there was this mezzanine in the american wing and along this mezzanine was these incredible paintings that were probably among the most quote unquote realistic i had ever seen and it was trump loy works from you know the the mid to late 1800s uh People like uh, William Michael Harnett and uh, John Haberly's bachelor drawer was there. And I was just, I was just bowled over. I mean, that, that, I mean, do you have a painting like that? Like one painting you could remember, uh, not to be too overly dramatic, but when I saw this painting, it was a game changer. What's that painting for you? Um, I'm not sure that it's only one necessarily. Um. But probably, it's a rough question. It's a hard question. It is. It's just that I mean I'm not sure because um, I didn't see that much work. I didn't see that much art in person when I was younger. Mm. And you know, like in you know, like in college or anything like that, I didn't. And I mean, I was you know, I grew up in Panama, so so I uh, I, I also wasn't able to see classical work also not in person anyway yeah. Um, yeah. but recently I was able to see Michelangelo work mm. at the Met and uh seeing some I mean not just seeing his 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 drawings uh but seeing a drawing that I don't remember what it's called um in person after having seen it lots mm. of times in pictures in books or whatever um, it's this lady that's kind of like this, kind of looking like this. Um, yep. It's one of the Sybils, I think. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, but I, I don't. I don't know if that's what, if that's what it is. That was. That was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's just that you know, and and well, getting. I mean, I want to ask you other stuff, and time is passing by, but um. <laughs> it's okay. Have, it's all right. Uh, but I, I I guess more on the Trump Loy. So. But that was it. That that okay. I, I remember that painting. Uh, to stay on track, that painting, the uh, John Haberly's bachelor's drawer. Um, when I saw that, I thought that th this is what I want to do. This is mm -hmm. what I mean. That was, like you said, it may be hard for a lot of people to say. You know, um, you know, I can't. I can't say there was any one painting. It was just like maybe a. a a series of exposures to different paintings or different art styles or different books or, you know, different life experiences, but man, I mean, and again, sure, sure. You know, what I do is, is a culmination of all these different life experiences, of course, but just what really, really set the rudder for me was, was seeing that, that painting and th this is this is what I want to do and it, it just seemed like I saw it at the right time because like I said the more the more realistic the representation that I was able to make the more motivated I got and then that would just kind of keep growing and growing and growing and growing and then just you know this this synergistic um the, the, this this synchronicity of me just seeing this painting at that right time is just that is what I want to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is what I want to do. And, okay, and that's when it. when was that? When did you see this painting? Uh, oh, you know, like, I was. How old were you? Yeah, or how long ago? Early to mid nineties. Okay. All right. So, yeah. so why do you keep doing it? Why do you keep doing Trump Lloyd? Um, because you know you could have gotten bored, or maybe you could have um, like found some other stylistic 
a, 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 another yeah, collection yeah. of stylistic decisions along the way, little changes that oh, result in something musician? else. So what do you think? Who, who's the, oh, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm really, really bad with names and dates. And um, there's a, a, a famous saying from a musician that was practicing uh, his instrument well into his 90s. And when someone asked yes, him, why uh -huh. are you still, why are you still practicing? And he answered, well, because I think I'm finally making some progress. It wasn't that B.B. King. No, 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 no. It was a cellist, I think. Oh. I would have to okay. look it up. I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. I've, so I've anyway, heard, yeah, I've heard that story. It's awesome. Yeah. And so, quote, you know. In that vein, you know, and I explained to, to some people that, that do ask me that, like, you know, your, and I'm, I'm not saying this to, to be egotistical at all, but they're like, you, you do this so well, there's just no way you can do it better. Mm. But, you know, one of the things I, I explain to students is that you, you have different domains of development, you know, different domains of learning. And the way I kind of break this down for students is that, you know, your ability to appreciate, you know, that, that domain of being able to appreciate, being cognizant of your skill deficit, or in simpler terms, being aware of how bad you are mm -hmm. at something. Mm -hmm your ineptitude, your ability to appreciate your ineptitude is going to grow much faster than the domains that will be responsible for you to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And that's a very frustrating, stressful thing. Now, I think that the speed at which those domains grow and develop come into more of a balance as you've been doing it longer but another another metaphor for this is when when people are saying are uh, why don't you get bored with this like why um do you really think you're going to get better and the answer is yes mm. and the the metaphor that i use for this is kind of like climbing a ladder you know the 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 higher i get the further i could see and the higher I get, the further I could see, the more, the more of the landscape I see there is still to explore. Now, someone on the ground looking up at me, when I'm really, really high on the ladder, the higher I climb, you know, each rung isn't going to make that much of a difference mm. from their perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, but every, you know, for me, when I'm up real high and I keep climbing higher, for me, those are those are just big changes that mm -hmm. I'm able to see further and further and further along on this landscape. So when okay. people are telling me you really can't get that much better, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like, I, I wish you could see this from my vantage point because that domain, even though the, the development of these different domains may have come into a little more um, similarity in terms of their expansion, that, that appreciation domain for what I still can't do, mm -hmm. even at my level, is still significantly bigger uh, than my ability to to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So I still will keep working and working. And you know, th this comes up a lot too. I tell a lot of people if if I felt that there was nothing else to learn on the path that I was on, I probably wouldn't choose to be on it anymore. Mm. You know, like if I couldn't learn anymore, think of how boring an activity would become. Yes. You know, so as long as I could keep learning and growing and challenging myself and there's, there's no shortage of things that you could, that you could take on that are going to increase your challenge that's going to push you to the edge of your limits, allowing you to grow beyond. There's no shortage of those things. So in the years I have left on this earth, that's what I plan on doing. All right. Okay. Well, 
I like that a lot. Good. And I want to say more stuff about that, but I want to ask you other okay. things. Um, so, okay. So Mr. White Chillis, what is Anthony, art in your opinion? Don't. Yeah. <laughs> what? You call me Anthony. You have to call All you right, Mr. Anthony, what is art in your opinion? Art is an experience. Art is a human experience. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? <laughs> um, that's just what it is. If I said to you, oh, let me turn this around. Um, what is color, Gabriella? Um, color is what we perceive when light bounces off different things. Okay. All right. Yeah. But ultimately, color is a, a biological response. It's it's a first person experience of a neurophysiological response to some environmental stimuli. Mm -hmm. What we call art, it, there's there's a very useful colloquial interpretation that art is an object just like there's a very useful colloquial every day. And that's what I mean when I say colloquial, just an everyday understanding that an apple is red. Mm -hmm. Well, the apple's not red. Okay. And the apple's not even shining red light. The apple is reflecting certain wavelengths of light, you know, like, like you've alluded to here. And when my biology interacts with that environmental energy i will respond my biology responds with a certain cascade of neural responses mm -hmm. okay neural activity a certain cascade of neural activity now the first person view of that activity is the experience of color in the same way art is a very robust series of neural responses to different stimuli that we experience and the experience label that we put on that is art mm -hmm. you know so um there is and this is what makes talking about art difficult um often a lot of discussions because it's so riddled with colloquial everyday language and a lot of just very useful uh everyday levels of understanding which which is very is, is very helpful to a lot of people in many cases you know it's very very useful i mean let's be honest uh, you know just um we tend to care much more about what's useful than what even may be true. It's, it's what is useful to us at, at any given time to find successful behavior. So we could point to an object and say, that's art. Okay. But you know, the fact of the matter, just like the color in that painting, well, there is no color in that painting, all the color, all the colors in here. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the color is an experience I have beyond that and something that gets a little more difficult for people to wrap their head around is images aren't out there images are in here there's there's no such thing as an image in the real world they that that does not exist you could have different types of surfaces different types of surfaces that might have different materials that have different reflectance properties on them so some things look dark and some things look light and some things will absorb and reflect light in a certain way that'll uh cause us to respond with a certain experience of color mm -hmm. um but the fact of the matter is there's no environmental information coming in that comes with instructions with what it is and these things require an assignment of meaning in fact a very simplified definition of perception is just a, a human assignment of meaning to a sensation so when certain light falls on my retina in a certain pattern that's still not an image my brain has to build that into an image so if things like color and images 
are in here and not out there, then art itself is in here, not out there, because all the components for it are in here. When you walk around, the, the most helpful way, you know, and I would have to, to throw in uh, with the way a lot of um, people exploring some phenomena of ourselves, we, we kind of look to modern day technologies to make a lot of analogies or metaphors that are useful. Sometimes they get a little problematic, but for the most part, they can be really, um, really, really useful. But I say, think of paintings and drawings as pieces of neural software. They're programs. And when you stand before uh, this painting or this drawing or this representation or a print uh, of some kind or even lights on a computer screen, when you stand before it, the, the patterns that light is arriving at your retina in, that's initiating a neural program that's running on your hardware. So as you're walking through a museum, that's that's what you're looking at. You you are you uh, as you move from one again colloquial image to the next, you are you know you are assigning colors, you are assigning meaning, you are building images, and this robust cascade of of neural activity is taking place in your mind. And the first person view of that is a pleasure technology, a, a pleasure bomb that we call art, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it appeals to all these, these um, different aesthetic responses that we've evolved for all these different things uh, throughout history, throughout our phylogenetic history. And the way we experience it now is it, it's it's become this whole pleasure technology of just you know there there's no there's no evolutionary reason that we should have any affinity that we should have any biological impetus to have great affinity for uh different colorant marks on fabric or different bits of graphite on a a, a piece of uh, paper or, or on a surface there's no evolutionary advantage in that but the the things that we that we uh you know we, we we've put all these things together all these things that we do like we've put them all together into one pleasure technology and we have this incredible experience that is is unlike anything else that um and the the um the psychologist, uh, what's his name? Uh, Steven Pinker writes about this. And I think, and this pissed some people off, but he used the analogy of cheesecake. Mm -hmm. like we didn't, we didn't evolve to select, you know, we, we didn't evolve to love cheesecake. Cheesecake is a pleasure technology we made. Okay. It's a pleasure technology we made because we have a drive for fats and sugars. So we took all these things together that we really love and we made them into one decadent pleasure technology a slice of cheesecake in the same way we took all these different things that we have drives for and draw uh that, that we're drawn to and we put it together in another type of pleasure technology that has that has come along with all these other things that were selected for and we call this art it gives us uh, 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 an incredibly alluring experience that has, you know, kinship with the pleasure technology that is cheesecake. And some people think, you know, that was, some people took offense at saying art is just like cheesecake. But the fact of the matter is whether we like what, you know, evidence suggests or not, you know, we, we have to follow the evidence where it goes. And really that's, that's what art is. It's, it's an experience that is derived from a pleasure technology that we have made for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That was a really long answer. I'm sorry about that. No, that's fine. That's, that's, that's fine. No worries. Um, I kind of feel like 
saying that it's a uh, pleasure technology insinuates some kind of like deliberate knowing like doing the thing on purpose for the purpose of pleasure of obtaining deriving pleasure from it and i'm not entirely sure and i mean that's that's all i mean if that was if that's the case with art obviously that's fine however i'm not entirely sure if I mean, I'm just, I'm just not entirely sure about it because it's like, you know, it's not, you know, cheesecake is obviously a much more recent invention than art is. It's like, arguably art has yep. been around almost as long as we have as homo sapiens sapiens because of all the things that we have found very, 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 very far back. Like, yeah. I think, yeah. I don't know, like a hundred, I don't know, more than a hundred thousand years uh, ago. So it's like, um, I feel as though, or not, I feel as though I have read here and there that it is linked to something more it's like it's like well, pleasure well, yeah. is it's like yeah. pleasure yeah. is a reason for which we pursue the production of art of course it's a reason it's like that is kind of like this almost like this like the reward for making the art but it's like yeah i mean don't don't forget we are and now art has the, the art that we developed the, this pleasure technology or uh another way to look at it that uh uh, Pinker and others also refer to it as, as a spandrel, uh, an, an evolutionary spandrel, like in architecture. You know, it's just something that shakes out from all these other things. Uh, but to say that, um, well, I mean, look, when it when it comes to what we feel are components of the human condition that are uniquely human and art I, I don't I don't I come from the camp where I don't believe art is uniquely human we see other mm -hmm. species engaging in activities that I mean if we look at bower birds if we look at Japanese puffer fish Bengalese yep. finches you can look at all these different animals that are engaging in different types of behavior um usually you know they they, they fall in the um into the category of you know, being useful for reproductive success. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, we, we do, we have this tendency to believe like, oh no, it's, it's, it's part of this more larger, grander scheme of what we are. And this is why people, you know, took offense at, at that cheesecake analogy, uh, the cheesecake comparison. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, it, it 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 is what it is. It's it's a it's. I really can't think of of a better phrase that it it's it's a it's a pleasure technology that has grown, uh, has developed aspects of social function for sure, um, but you could see like our 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 penchant to you know, communicate and express comes from the fact that we're a very, very social species. Uh, we like to uh, create things and make things. And um, we, we have enormous draw to demonstrations of virtuosity, uh, of greatness. You know, we want, uh, I mean, this is why, this is why a, a, you know, in terms of the, the neural program, because that's an objection some people might give me. Well, well, Anthony, if it's a neural program, then how come uh, we, we put much greater value uh, on a, a original piece of artwork than a print if they are both showing the exact same thing and one is an original and one is not? Why does the original have some type of different experience? Uh, isn't there something that that is like, you know, transcendent, fa and in a way there is, there's, there's a lot of extrinsic factors that we take into account, like provenance, authenticity. Uh, we have this, we have this belief that, you know, uh, greatness could be transferred through a, a process of contagion. And um, yeah, we're, we're just, we're, we're, um, we're generally irrational beings that developed a technology that has become uh, uh, very important to us you know and that's 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 just what it is and 
you know, there's there's a lot of people that like to entertain far more romantic visions of art. And I, I think that if that if that gives you pleasure, then so be it, you know. But when people ask me what is art, I, I would tell them this is what all the current evidence from different fields, this is where they converge. This is what it's telling us art is. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't have a problem necessarily with the relationship with uh, cheesecake. It's just that. Um, yeah, I think people and, focus too much on the cheesecake. Um, it's just, uh, and also, I don't have a problem with the relationship between everything. Not relationship. I don't have a problem with everything humans do being derived from wanting to perpetuate the species. It's like some people actually, some people also get offended by that, you know. Um, like for example, there's lots of uh, either men or women who are who think women being like more willing to reproduce during the ovulation is like oh, but whatever. It's like you know they have a problem with that, and it's like it's like I don't think that's a problem at all. It's like it's just like a biological thing, um, and I I like I really like the the creativity in a way of nature of figuring out of, of, uh, you know, resulting in all of these behaviors just for the purpose of, of like encouraging reproduction in a, yep. you know, the, the, the reproductive impetus in a, in a, in a species. I mean, I think that's pretty cool because it's like base, because it, it's, it's like if, if a person says, yeah, everything we do is basically just revolving around that. I think like, wow, that's very creative. And uh, that's lots of ingenuity there. It's like, yeah, you know, no. if you're interested, I just I wanted to make sure I had the whole talk because I'm I'm so bad with book titles, but a, a really a really uh, good read mm -hmm. if if you're very taken with human creativity, uh, a really really great read I would recommend is a book called The Creative Spark: How Imagination Made Humans Exceptional, mm -hmm. and it is written by and I hope I pronounce this right Augustin Fuentes. And it, I loved it. It's a wonderful book. Um, and for people that uh, want to learn more about, um, you know, how is it put? Kind of a, a a Darwinian theory of beauty, and I would say it's all, almost of art. Uh, I would look to uh, Dennis, the, the late philosopher Dennis Dutton, wrote yeah. a book called The Art Instinct. I yeah, would yeah, definitely... that's 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 the that's actually about what I was what I was trying to say. I've been I've been reading that book for a little while now, and I like his hypothesis a lot. Yeah. Um, in that, well, I mean, in his case, it's more about the things that we're drawn to are things that have led that have perpetuated our survival, and like that's why people like landscapes and whatever. Um, yeah. Which I I really like because the the argument. I don't know. It just seems really solid, you know. You know, like I, I, um, I, I, I feel like we really tend to forget how long we've been here and how long this whole stuff, that's this whole thing, has been here. That things have developed from just like behaviors and stuff that we didn't know. It's like you know, you had, we, you know, we first had religion and then we had alchemy and then we had chemistry and then we had science, you know, something like that. So, so, yeah. So, okay, I really like that, and uh, I was, I meant to mention that as well in connection yeah. to. And if, if you thing. do, if you do want to read um, a, a, a very short, uh, I don't know if it was if it'd be called a paper or an essay, um, Steven Pinker wrote, and I believe it's called We Make Art Because We Can. Uh, and I, I think he includes the cheesecake analogy in there. And you'll see he, uh, same, same uh, phrase he uses, uh, pleasure technology. Um, and there's a lot of synchronicity with uh, uh, another uh, book that I really enjoyed um, from psychologist Paul Bloom. It's another easy read that uh, it's, I always get this title wrong too. It's um, the new science of why we like what we like, how pleasure works. I think it's called how pleasure works, why we like what we like. But you'll see there's there's just a lot of a lot of themes that just keep um you know aligning and all these the, all these different fields that are are looking into different aspects of what again we might collectively call art um 
they they really they line up so well and it you know a lot of the evidence converges um so remarkably well that you know but we look we like to attribute you know these these grand you know cosmic reasons for why we're doing this and that and these these you know collective consciousness influences and and, and again there's a lot of gr grandiose romantic ideas that you know just connect us to this transcendent realm of concepts and, and and i do get that i get the allure of that i get the attraction of that but you know the fact of the matter is you know we the the our behaviors regardless our behaviors are defined by our biology so when i was when, when i was um i graduated you know a college and then i went uh, to Baltimore, to a wonderful, wonderful school, the Schuler School of Fine Arts in uh, Baltimore. And uh, it was a, a, a tremendous experience for me. And when I was finished there in Baltimore, um, and I, you know, I was pursuing Trump Loy now, full force, you know, every, everything was all systems go. You know, I came to the realization that to make really, really realistic images wasn't really a matter of who could render the best or wasn't a matter, wasn't a matter of like better and better rendering, or it wasn't a matter of more and more detail. It was a matter of understanding the hardware that the software runs on, hmm. you know? So that's when, I started just getting my hands on as many books as I can, uh, or I could rather. Um, on, I started with like just psychology. You know, I just started reading book after book after book. I mean, I took psychology courses in college, but, you know, I really, really, you know, poured myself into it. Like, how how are we perceiving these images? How are we how are we building these images in our head? Like what, what type of responses uh, could we expect? How much control can I have over the responses that, uh, that people have when presented with these different stimuli, you know, these different drawings, these different representations, these different paintings, these, these objective representations, how, you know, how much control can I have? And then the psychology sort of grew into you know, um, evolutionary psychology, a little evolutionary biology, kind of understanding more about, well, uh, the same, this idea of, well, we could understand who we are better if we understand our journey. And so then I started to like, look more into, you know, different aspects of evolution. Like I said, uh, evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology. And then I thought, well, let me, let me really get down into the nuts and bolts of what the brain is doing. And that's when I really got into uh, perceptual neuroscience and a lot of biology. And at that time, I realized, hey, uh, not only can I read, but I could just start taking classes, um, you know, uh, when I have time, you know. And uh, unfortunately, my ability to pick up and jump into another a whole nother several years of just school was difficult because I had already started a private studio that was becoming more and more successful and I had a painting career that was doing very very well and I was very very pleased but so then like eventually like I realized aside from the books uh you could start taking class like you know classes online or you know there was a lot of long distance learning opportunities that started to pop up and then I just started enrolling in class after class on, you know, neuroscience and neurophysiology and neuroanatomy and understanding, you know, uh, how the brain had, had evolved and a lot of still more evolutionary psychology. And then I realized that 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 was the key to getting more and more, quote unquote, realistic images, because Trump Loy work, Trump Loy work wants you, you know, my my interpretation of, of the goal of this pursuit is to get as close to perfect percept surrogacy as possible what that means is that i am trying to create something that will create an experience for you 
that is as close as possible to you experiencing perceptually those actual objects in the real world. Okay. okay. That stimuli I've created is a percept surrogate. Okay. It is a, it, it is, a, it is a surrogate device for encountering those objects visually in the real world. And the way for me to do that, um, to get better and better at doing that required better and better understandings of how we perceive things, uh, the types of meanings uh, that we apply to different sensations, um, learning a lot about the different behavioral responses that we tend to have, the defaults, uh, and just really trying to build up that knowledge base as much as I can. Uh, because I didn't want to go back to school and be and you know become a, an expert in neuroscientist that painted. I wanted to be a painter that became obsessed with understanding how art works. Okay. And neuroscience, specifically perceptual neuroscience, um, and a lot of evolutionary biology and psychology really opened the door for me to understand how to write better percept surrogate neural programs. That's the, that's, that sounds like a super complicated way to say it, but it's probably the best way I could say it is to create things that are going to run the type of experience programs that I would like it to, to elicit. Okay. Um, <laughs> No, it that reminds me of um because I've been reading I'm also reading the um, a book on the notes of Le on Leonardo da Vinci's notes mm -hmm. of which there are so many apparently and um one of there's like a section on notes that he made directed at artists and he's like learn how the eye works yeah to yeah, paint I mean, it's like I said, if, if art is an experience, if art is an experience you're having, then I have to find out how best to deliberately control the type of experience you're going to have. Now, for me, I think that is the key to true creative freedom. True creative freedom is not a mix of deliberateness and happenstance. Although some some may perceive uh, the creative process as uh, containing happenstance, but for me, creative freedom is is all about being incredibly deliberate, and um, that that's really been the goal in in you know the the majority of the years I've been doing this is how do I become more deliberate in creating something so so that you have the perceptual experience that I would intend you to have. Now, I think for I mean at least for me personally, that type of communication has some of the greatest potential because unlike a written or spoken language where you may not be familiar with like the syntax and pragmatics and whatnot, like you might not be able to read a certain language, but if I could communicate to you through simply um, one of your most uh, significant senses, you know, if I, if I could learn to impart onto you ideas and concepts and uh, narratives and allegories and symbols in in such a way where I could appeal to your relatively reflexive responses to to these these things that I'm making. Um, I mean, to me, that's 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 the tops. That's 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 the big goal for me to get to get you to see exactly what I want you to see. Okay. All right, uh, Anthony, then what is beauty in your opinion? Uh, beauty is uh, simply a positive aesthetic response. The, the things that we find uh, attractive as opposed to things that are repulsive, beauty is simply 
the positive end of that spectrum. Um, the, the, the responses that have evolved to encourage certain behaviors, that's what I would call beauty. Mm -hmm. You know, we are, let's say, you know, we, we might find, um, certain things beautiful. Pick something, you know, uh, let's say we find a specific object to have great beauty. Uh, that response may be either in part or it, it could be due to one or many um, responses that have evolved to promote a certain behavior, a certain type of interaction with that object. You know, uh, Dennis Dutton, if you're reading that book, I want to say... He talks about if you want to know what type of landscapes are the most beautiful, start to look at calendar makers, people that publish calendars, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, on, on average, they will have cultivated the types of images that most people will find very, very attractive. And again, we're talking about, you know, we, we might find things um, we might find that we have certain indiv individual preferences uh, for certain things based on our own, um, the, the, the experiences of, our, of just our lifetime. But you, we have to realize that a lot of our positive and negative aesthetic responses comes, you know, not only for our own lifetime, but that's what I, 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 I that's what that uh, means before I use phylogenetic, the, the lifetime of our species as well. You know, it's their collective experiences and, uh, you know, certain types of neural architecture that had been selected for due to the experiences of our ancestors over time. You know, we develop preferences for this, repulsions for that, and, you know, a, a spectrum in between. And we look at an object now and find it beautiful. Um, you know, the, the reason the reason that we, we find these things beautiful is because the um the the response th those responses have been demonstrated to be advantageous to us mm -hmm. you know the, the the behaviors that it's promoting in us those those behaviors um those behaviors brought about reproductive success and uh that's again that's what beauty is and again you're, you're, you're going to get a lot of that in, in that art instinct book you'll you'll mm -hmm. definitely read a lot of that um so what do you say in that case when because um i mean i don't know if you saw any of the previous episodes but um some people associate beauty and the sensations invoked in the person by beauty um, they there's like an association with like fear and um, you know like when one encounters like the Grand Canyon or something or when you see the Milky Way on a dark night or something yeah. and you you know you one thinks about the kind of like endlessness of time and like the limit how limited one is you know we're mortal and all that stuff it's just like what do you think of when people make this association of being struck by that uh, and associating it with beauty and then also associating it with like terror like I think somebody before in one of a previous episode said for example like oh you know you look at a tiger it's like it's an amazing beautiful animal but it can kill you and take your life away so what do you think about that yeah I mean I, I think that um yeah I mean I know people that have described a roller coaster ride as like a, a, a I, I'm not a big roller coaster guy but, uh, you know, I, I have some friends that, I mean, they, that is beautiful when they're getting whipped around and upside down and, you know, get spun all over. Um, beauty, you know, we could say in broad, in broad terms, you know, what, what is, what, what is beauty? You know, that, that's what I, I mentioned before, but, you know, what we describe as beautiful it's not, it's not very, it's not very clear cut, mm -hmm. you know, it's not very, and again, it's just, it, a lot of it is just the, 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 
how nebulous our language is. Like when we call something beautiful, when we say, oh, that's, that's beautiful. That's a beauty. What a beaut. You know, like that could be describing such a wide array of very subtly interwoven responses. I mean, the, the, the landscape of potential for what might qualify from one person to another as beautiful is enormous and it's enormously complex. And I hope I didn't communicate that at any given point that, that any of it is very simple and very clear cut and dry. It's enormously complex, our, our responses. And, you know, you have a great deal of individual preferences, you know, and honestly, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I agree with other, you know, authors and researchers on this subject that it's, it's often not really interesting to me at all. Like what, what type of individual preferences people have, you know, and the example I use is, is, is ice cream, you know, as, as an artist, I, you know, if I was, if I, you know, what do they call them? It's Subway sandwich artist. Let's say I worked in an ice cream shop and I was an ice cream artist, you know, I couldn't really say, or, or I really, you know, couldn't design. I couldn't design my success around outside of, you know, just, just business operating experiences of, of knowing to stock up more, like maybe on average, more people would like this than that. You know, but overall, I would say, look, I, I could make a good argument that you are likely outside of some intolerance or, 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 or very negative experience you might have had. Maybe you have an ice cream phobia, you know, uh, that is rooted in some experience. Maybe you had an, an unbelievably horrible experience with ice cream. But on average, and this is the level of resolution that I try to navigate uh, potential aesthetic responses that people might have. The level of resolution is on the average as a whole. I can't say what type of ice cream you may or may not like. I can't say whether it's more likely you like strawberry over vanilla, over chocolate, over Rocky Road, whatever. But what I can say with, with pretty good certainty is that if you're a human, you're going to have a predilection for fat and sugar. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, ice cream is to like cheesecake. It's a pleasure technology. That's going to play on that. Okay. So when you get down to the level of individual preference, I can't say which one you might, Oh, this is a beautiful flavor. It, well, if we're getting down to the level of individual preference, that's not super helpful. Uh, when when you're navigating things like aesthetics as an artist, you know, again, using the ice cream and and um, predilections for fat and sugar as a species as a as a, a, a like a comparison, you know, I, I can't really say more so whether this person's going to like uh, wintry landscapes versus, you know, um, rural pastoral landscapes or this person's going to like. Uh, you know, happy fruit still lifes, and this person's going to like Vanitas works and this and that. But, you know, I, I will say on average, people are going to have positive aesthetic responses to these other things that are better evaluated more at the resolution of the species as a whole. And you can make some pretty good predictions about how people might respond to certain things. But, um, you know, when getting at the, the root of your question, how some people might find terror or this and that uh, all mixed up with beauty and how some of this fear or terror or apprehension might even seem to um, grow that experience of beauty. I mean, these are, these are really complex, you know, species wide and individualistic complex quilts of responses that, you know, just because one person might find, you know, very, uh, you know, terror filled. Like I'm a big horror movie nut. Like I love horror movies. Like I'm just, you know, I can't wait for uh, fall is my favorite time of year. Cause I just, all, all the horror movies get, come, you know, come out, but um, big horror movie fan. I, I think those are, I would say, oh, this movie is beautiful. This is a beautiful movie. 
you know um but that that is a mixture that response is a mixture of some visual things that just about anyone might find attractive for one reason or another but there's also been individual preferences of myself that you know contribute to that so like all these things get mixed up together and they might fall under a very generalized umbrella that any one of us might point to and say this is beautiful or that's beautiful but i don't know if i made much sense but it's it, it was a it was a bit of a complex answer and it's you know it's the, the some of these answers are so incredibly complex that it's not something i'm going to i'm going to throw out in a couple of you know a couple of quick catchy catchy um summaries you know mm. I'm, i i do the best i can i know i get really wordy and ver verbose too but um you know cuz it it's just important to me that i think people I think people could more successfully explore the potential of the things they could do in the realm of art if they understand some of the foundational nut, nuts and bolts at this level. If you could understand what's happening on this level, then I think your I think it could open up a door of a much larger world of deliberate creative freedom that's that 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 you know you, you may not have as much access to as you might want and at least for me for what i wanted to do uh this was very important to me but you know there there's some people that do like you know a, a little more you know bravado and cavalier nature in their artwork and what they're doing and they might like to hold on to a little more of the more romantic notions surrounding art or the the more transcendent concepts of uh, of what art is to so many people and and again i get that and i i would never want to um work in any way to and I, and i i hope i didn't communicate this earlier but i i wouldn't want to work towards diminishing that in any way i, I want to be open with the information i have and my perspective on these things but i also think that art is very important it's, it's very important that you're being fulfilled that you know i i think that you should be free to find as much fulfillment in this pursuit as you can and i'm not running around trying to like pop anyone's balloons with this stuff but for the people that are interested in this you know i try to to be as vocal as I can about it. So people realize, Hey, there are these answers. It takes more work than some of the, you know, understanding the heuristics and cognitive shortcuts and quick tips and tricks that you might garner uh, on your, on your creative journey. It, it does take more work to delve into these things, to build a comprehensive understanding, even though some aspects of that understanding may, may very well be provisional, but, um, it, it, it makes the most sense to me and it, it allows me to educate in the most meaningful way that I can. And that's also very important to me. Okay. Well, I really like what you said about, um, what was it? <laughs> uh, no, it, it was something that you said I know, just there was now. So, I, Listen, I, I ramble on, I know. I, I know I do, so I hope I hope I'm not rambling too much. Uh, no, it's just I mean, no, I don't think you ramble. It's just that I want to try to remember something you said just now because I liked it as kind of like a, a nice thing to end the 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 episode with. It was the thing about knowing how the perceptual system perceptual perceptual system works, meaning you know your uh, your eyes, your brain, psychology, this stuff, in order to make deliberate decisions when one is making work. Yeah. And not just like, all right, I'll take a pencil and a paper and hope for the best, you know, yeah. because um, I, but that might, that might be a way that some people really enjoy it. Like, look, I don't want to, I don't want to study too much into this aspect of it. I just like enjoying it on this level. And you know what I say? That's fantastic. And I think you should do that. I think if that brings you great pleasure and you choose to engage with the pursuit on that level, I just want to be clear. I think that is a beautiful thing. Yeah. But I think that um, for me, it's 
you know, the, the pursuit is fueled by trying to be as deliberate as I possibly can. You know, I think that, um, my creativity is enhanced through the development of deliberate mark making. And, you know, that's, that, that's what I teach. That's, um, there was a really good line that I remember reading somewhere. And I can't remember where I read it that, uh, artistic, something about artistic freedom and, uh, you know, being built on, you know, the mortar of your artistic foundation should not be riddled with ineptitude. Uh, something along those lines that, you know, uh, the, the gist of it was like, you want to make sure that your, your, your foundations are as, are as well developed and understood as they possibly could be without a lot of just empty unexplored pockets that you can't have a lot of confidence in that these things may not be consistently reliable. And for me, I, I don't like that. Like I, I, I like to try to remove as much of, of that, um, as, uh, as much of those just unknowns that could really uh, impact consistency or the level of quality that I'm going after. And for me, that's all, you know, that's, that's all aspects of building a uh, more grand capacity for increased creative freedom. All right. Well, I also like that as the closing out of the episode, Anthony. So uh, why don't you tell our future list, our listeners and viewers uh, where your work can be found? Do you have any upcoming projects, anything you're working on, anything you want to add? Yeah, so um, right now, uh, the, the vast majority of my work is usually found uh, in Denver's Gallery 1261. Wonderful gallery. They have an incredible roster of talent. Um, I would recommend visiting uh, Gallery 1261's website, uh, not just for my work. There's, And this goes for all the, the galleries I'll mention. I also have um a few works in another uh gorgeous gallery in alexandria virginia uh it's the principal gallery and a show just opened there that is called still fresh and it is a exhibition that is focused on still life work um i also have some work occasionally with the robert lang gallery in charleston um some work I have on occasion with Tulsa, uh, Tulsa's Lovitz Gallery. And I know I'm going to forget somebody. And I'm gonna, oh, and uh, Santa Fe, um, the Meyer Gallery. That is uh, another absolutely phenom phenomenal gallery. One of my favorite artists, that's a good friend of mine, Natalie Featherston shows there. So uh, definitely check out the Meyer Gallery. Um. I have a uh, really exciting show coming up this fall that I'm just getting ready for now, which is an exhibition of high definition representational painters. It's a showcase that Gallery 1261 is um, uh, very nicely uh, allowing me to curate. So we have mm. a lot of my favorite high definition painters and the um the title of the show is tight mm. and it was funny i put out a um some people said oh you know that's that that might be an inappropriate title and i you know it was funny we i, I put that out on social media i'm like who thinks this is inappropriate i, th I think this is a Just but i'm asking mean, for it <laughs> you know what i'm saying absolutely absolutely but you know s s shockingly uh it was overwhelming they're like if you don't go with this title you're you're an idiot it's a it's a good title and uh yeah i love it you know i i've i've often described very high definition representation as uh, you know a very tight form of painting as opposed to very loose forms of painting and uh yeah so i'm very very excited about that show i'm also excited because the the uh our art schools the yanni art academies 
Uh, we're having a very large show, uh, Capturing Realism Caribbean, that is featuring works from our school in the, in the Dominican Republic and our school in Anguilla. Uh, we are having a large show at a very, very big gallery in the Dominican Republic in October. And then right on the heels of that, we're starting to get ready for another big academic showcase in Asia called Capturing Realism Asia. I'm very, mm. very excited about that. So there's a lot of really, really big projects coming up. If you want to uh, learn anything about or, or view my own work, uh, you can go to my website, anthonywhitechulis.com. There's also uh, the, the, the school uh, that I work that I work at and um, that is uh, it's a remarkable it's a you know and it it sounds very braggy but it it, you know it's these schools are fantastic they were uh, this is all the 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 Yanni Art Academies is the brainchild of uh, an an absolutely amazing person uh, Tim Reynolds and he wanted to do this global education project. And now we have six schools in five countries. Mm. And um, the, the great part is everyone goes to school for free. Uh, there's, nice. you know, all the, everyone that gets accepted into the, the program, uh, full, to, full merit scholarships, covers all their materials, everything. And uh, it's odd, you know, we've, it, we, we've been, We've been active for years now, but people still think when they see the advertisements for our schools that there's still some kind of catch. They're like, I don't, I don't get what you guys do. What, what happens? Like, what do I have to do? Do I have to work for you or something like, no, it's just, it's, it's a guy that has enormous resources and is incredibly passionate about the arts. And this is what he wanted to do with part of his life was give educational opportunities to to those that that may not have otherwise been able to have those opportunities to be a creative you know and that directly speaks to the person that we we spoke about um at the beginning of this podcast you know that speaks right to that person i was almost 30 years ago that didn't know that i could make a career out of Mm. this and now i'm very uh honored and privileged to be able to provide educational opportunities to those same people that you know that that the people that were identical to me uh 30 years ago it, it's a it's a really really special thing and if you want more information on that in the schools that's on eartacademies.org and lastly uh my my late wife and i built a resource called smartermarks.com s-m-a-r-t-e-r-m-a-r-x and it has been the resource that just has a ton of our educational information that's totally free on there a lot of our resources that are free um so definitely if you want to if you want to dig through a lot of the resources that we have that's another great site to go so those are the three big sites i would recommend i hope that's not too much of like a plug no, that's fine. Podcast, yeah. That's the point of the of this part. Yeah, so you that's, guys, that's so you, a lot of stuff. If it's if it's inappropriate, you just cut it out. I uh, no, I don't I don't edit I don't edit the videos. Oh, the cool. Recordings, so no worries. Unfortunately, right, well, my dogs weren't running around and barking, so that was great. Yeah, they were very well behaved. Very well All right. behaved. All right. Well, um, thank you, Anthony, very much. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. Uh, and again, special thanks to my guest, Anthony, for agreeing to talk to me and for uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, If you'd like to support Anthony, my podcast, myself, or all three, all uh, pertinent links will be in the caption. Make sure you like this video and leave a comment so we know you saw this episode. And also remember to subscribe to my audiovisual channel. And well, um, thank you, everyone. And see you next time. Bye.